It's just after a quarter past six. In the next 45 minutes, we shall be bringing you a background on Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, who was today sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder of 13 women in the north of England. He was a young man so apparently ordinary that for five years he was able to elude the biggest manhunt in British criminal history. In that time, he drove freely over a wide area between Leeds and Manchester, attacking and murdering women. Some listeners may find parts of the programme distressing. This portrait of Peter William Sutcliffe is presented by Chris Underwood. This is BBC Radio Leeds. Good morning. It's Thursday, October the 20th, 1975. Police are investigating the discovery of a woman's body on a playing field in the Chapeltown district of Leeds. The woman, who hasn't yet been identified, was found by a milkman on his early delivery round. Murder squad detectives have been called in and a press conference on the case will be held later this morning. The broadcast you've just heard marked the first killing in a campaign of violence and death by a man who's been dubbed the Yorkshire Ripper. For more than five years, the Ripper brought terror to a number of towns and cities in the north of England. For more than five years, women were afraid to go out alone in case they became his next victim. come up from behind them, they don't have a chance. You're not a man, you're a beast. Oh, you can hit their headlines all right, but um, it's nothing to be proud of, the things that you do. And uh, I just don't know how you can sleep at night. It's deserted on here at night, so used to be. Loads walking up and down. Never see anybody now. I think you're probably a very inadequate person, certainly physically and probably mentally too. tall man is able to exert uh, quite a lot of strength when he's committed these murders. Many people are looking for you and they all hate you. I wonder who you think you are. Do you damn well think you are God or something? God give life, God taketh it away, not you. I think you are the devil itself. And that night I was hustling as he left somebody's house. I couldn't tell you which house he left, but he left a house and he waved to somebody. As I approached him, he asked me if I was doing business and I said yes. He, asked me how, he didn't ask me how much, he said five pounds, so I said okay and I got into the car then. He drove up Leopold Street onto Chapel Town Road. He only spoke a couple, about a few words, but he didn't say his name was Peter Sutcliffe, he told me it was Dave. And I told him to call me Susan. Then he took me to their place where I, I already knew the place because I've used that place many times before. He pulled up. He spoke once, he asked me to get in back of the car and I agreed. And with, as I as he got out of the car, I put my shoe back on, my left shoe. And then I got out of the car and as I got out to the back door, he attacked me from the back. On the first blow, I never felt. On the second and third, I felt it. I put my hands up to my head more or less save my head but I got injuries on my thumb and injuries on the back of my head. The voice of Marilyn Moore now aged 29 and one of seven women savagely attacked by the ripper Peter Sutcliffe and left for dead. Unlike 13 other women Marilyn recovered but she still has nightmares about that night in December four years ago when she became the ripper's tenth victim. Peter William Sutcliffe was born on June the 2nd 1946 his mother, Kathleen, was a devout Roman Catholic. 
His father, John Sutcliffe, local singer and keen cricketer, still lives in the area where the family grew up, at Bingley, a West Yorkshire town ten miles from Bradford. He was the eldest of his children. He was only a very tiny baby, only five pounds when he was born, and he, uh, he took rather a long while to grow up. He wasn't slow by any means, but uh, he could talk just as reasonably as you expect any child to talk, but he was very, very slow getting on his feet. He eventually practically learnt to walk by holding his mother's skirts and going round the house with her. And it was a habit that he, he clung to until he was about four or five years of age. Every time she moved, he used to grab her skirt and go after her. Peter Sutcliffe went to the Roman Catholic Manor Road School at Cottingley near Bingley. One of his teachers was Mr Louis McGovin, now retired, who remembers him because he was such an unremarkable boy. All I can remember is that he was a very quiet, obedient, respectful boy. He never shone in any way, and I would simply say that he was uh, of average intelligence, but very quiet and reserved. And uh, he showed it interest, but he was reluctant to uh, take any vocal part. He didn't mix very well with the other children because he never had the physical capacity to do so. As a, as a kid, he was always a bit on the on the light side. You know, he couldn't stand a lot of bullying and pushing around. I know when he when he started school at first, my wife or myself would go down every afternoon during the afternoon break at school to see how he was getting on, and quite often find him with his back up against a buttress in the playground on the side of the school, um, sort of standing in the corner, watching the other kids running about. It used to worry me quite a bit. As a child then, Sutcliffe stood alone. But on reaching his late teens, he came out of his shell. After a series of short-lived jobs, he became a grave digger and part-time mortuary attendant at Bingley Cemetery. According to friends and relatives, he loved his job and was deeply disappointed when he was sacked for bad timekeeping. His brother, Mick Sutcliffe, whose full story is to appear in the Daily Star newspaper, talks of Peter's physical strength. I once did a bit of amateur boxing and a hell of a lot of training. I was very fit at the time. Actually, I'm, I'm very strong at arm wrestling, you know. I won gallons of beer in different pubs for it, you know, against 15 stone and 16 stone blocks. And I've, I've only lost to... Uh, well, two people, and one of them was my brother, Peter. He's much smaller in height and a stone and a half lighter, but he could beat me, and there's no way every time we tried to beat me. I just couldn't understand it with weight difference and size. A very strong person indeed. As a youth, Sutcliffe dressed teddy boy style, developed a keen interest in cars, and frequented the Royal Standard pub near Lum Lane, Bradford's notorious red light district. One of his friends at the time was Laurie Ashton, fellow gravedigger and drinking companion. In that Royal Standard, we were once in there, now Peter did, did something. He, he banged down that table or something and, and, and a beer glass b got broke in situation, accidentally. Mm. Now, a certain lad got up and threw a full pint of beer on, in Peter Sutcliffe's face. Now, that lad didn't, didn't retaliate in one way, not even argue. Another former friend, Keith Sugden, an unemployed printer, recalls a night, however, when Peter Sutcliffe did lose control. Well, the occasion was one evening, you know. Uh, we'll say well, all we were doing that evening was sort of playing records and listening to tapes, and uh, there were a girl there, she was only about 16, I think, and uh, one of the lads went to that force his attentions on her, and uh, she started, you know, carrying on a bit. You know, she didn't like it. So Peter stepped in and uh, stuck him one on, that's the only way I can put it. You know, it certainly upset him, did that occasion, he just got mad. I've never seen, that's the only time I've seen Peter lose his temper. It's the only one time. Many people in the area remember Sutcliffe's fascination for prostitutes and sordid liaisons. Men friends recall nights touring the red light districts of northern towns with Sutcliffe at the wheel. On the night before he married, on his stag night, Sutcliffe went curb crawling in Lum Lane. 
and it's become known that he had an extended affair with a 19-year-old girl called Teresa, who he met on a visit to Motherwell in Scotland. He told her he was Peter Logan, the name of an old friend in Bingley. But despite everything, boyhood friend and fellow lorry driver Malcolm Crook knew Sutcliffe as a shy man who appeared frightened of women. If he's on his own, or it wasn't with the lads, you know, he'd never chat a, a young lady up intentionally, himself. If there's two or three lads there and there's two or three lasses, then he'd mix, yeah. But somebody had to break the ice for him. Keith Sugden's wife, Doreen, who knew Sutcliffe before she married, confirms this impression. The local girls never liked him. They'd never go with him, you know. I mean, he used to say to me often, um, will he get, you know, one of your mates and make a foursome? But none of my mates said, you know, I'd go with him. And I never saw him with any local girls. You know, you know I think it would be because he had no conversation. It used to be that silly grin, smirky grin. And, you know, they, they just used to say, we're queer. If we met him in a pub, uh, the girls would more or less go to Peter. Peter would never go to the girls. Because, uh, you know, when a young is a look, good looking lad, you know, he's got that foreign continental look. And especially in a semi dark atmosphere, he, uh, I should say, looked quite attractive to the girls, you know. They certainly got a few over. But what was the relationship like between Sutcliffe and Keith's wife, Doreen? I don't think he liked me. I, I don't know, you know, I don't know why. I think he, I think I would have, you know, I wouldn't wait of him and, you know, Keith. Keith was at our house and uh, Pete came to the door. We'd arranged to go out with him actually the night before and it came about nine o'clock in the evening and he never said oh, about these two girls being in the back of the car or anything. We just went out to the car and these two girls, well one were in the front, one was in the back. And uh, he took us down to the, a pub called the Vic down Shipley and when these two girls went to the toilet Pete turned to me and Keith and he just said, these two girls are on the game. Well, straight away, I, you know, I got mad and I said to Keith, I want to go home, you know. So Keith said to Pete, will you, you know, will you run us back to Doreen? She says she wants to go home. And that was it, he ran us back home. I think it was try, to try to split man and his relationship. Um, he, had, he, he had my head, Keith. In fact, I, I know it, it sounds awful, but I thought that Pete was in love with Keith. Apart from cars, casual drinking and his lorry driving job, Sutcliffe had few interests. You see, Peter had, had no musical ability. He liked music, but he couldn't sing. You know, like most lads can get a, a tune out. Peter never could. I mean, he was one of those lads that, you know, no matter how long he trained him, he'd never be able to get a tone. Uh, he couldn't play a musical instrument. I played guitar a little bit. Uh, and all he had sort of was his car. It didn't come through, but he hadn't much to, to grow up on, you know. And despite his father's attempts to interest him in sport, Sutcliffe had no time for that either. Nor, apparently, during those early years, did he take much notice of girls. I never knew him to have a steady girlfriend, or even a girlfriend at all, until he met Sonia, the girl he married. And she was only a 16 year old schoolgirl at the time, but within, oh, probably a fortnight of meeting her, he brought her home and introduced her. And um, he used to come home with her, bring her home regularly after that. She had very little to say, and when she did say anything, it was in a very, very quiet voice. She almost whispered. Peter Sutcliffe met Sonia Schirmer, daughter of Czechoslovakian parents, when she was a 16-year-old student. They married in the Baptist Chapel at Clayton near Bradford on the 10th of August 1974, Sonia's 24th birthday. They kept to themselves again, you see. Whereas we, we were sat at a table. They were sat on, you know, sat on the little stage in, in Royal Standard then. And they used to ju ju sit between stage and joke box and just sit together and sort of like keep away from us, you know. Eleven months after the wedding, Sutcliffe began the series of attacks on women. The first was the attempted murder of Anna Raguski at Keithley in June 1975. A month later, Sutcliffe was in Halifax where he attacked Mrs. Olive Smelt. The first woman to die was Mrs. Wilma McCann, who Sutcliffe picked up in Leeds in October 1975. 
During this period, Sutcliffe was friendly with Trevor Birdsall, who gave prosecution evidence at the Old Bailey. Birdsall's estranged wife, Melissa, also knew Sutcliffe well. He used to go at night and see these prostitutes. And I think all this was happening when she was away. And I mean, she must have known he was faithful to sort of part like that all the time. But, but he wasn't. How were we going to tell her once? Because every time she went away, he used to just have a wild time. That's when I knew he used to come for Trev. And they'd sometimes go out two nights running. And I, I even heard that beat used to go with him at lunch times. Melissa Birdsall also talked about an occasion when Sutcliffe visited their home some years before he got married. Peter Sutcliffe came round to my ex-husband's and he said, uh, are, you, are you offer a drink, Trev? He says, yeah. So it was that night, you know, they went to Halifax and then something must have happened while they were out because when my ex-husband came home that night, he said that, you know, they went to Halifax and Peter Sutcliffe said he, he did to prostitute overhead with a stone in a sock. So Trevor told me then. And, you know, I, I just said it's rotten and he seemed alarmed, you know. It, it sounded as if he was there with him anyway. You know, the way he said that, she felt it flow and all that. And then he said he got back in the car and I think they must have come straight home then that night. He did say, suppose he'd have killed her, Liz. I says, I don't know. I says, he'd have got done, wouldn't he, if he had it done? But it was at back at Ed. And then he started thinking, you know, that Peter could be Yorkshire Ripper. And Keith Sugden remembers an occasion when Sutcliffe was obviously concerned about his sexual adventures. I met him in the Fern's Arms in Bingley and uh, he said he wanted to see me in Gent's toilet and uh, I got in the toilet and uh, he got his uh, private part out and uh, said to me, I think I've got a dose of one of them mucky women. So uh, I told him if he were worried about it, he'd better move up to uh, St Luke's Hospital, which I believe they had the uh, VD unit up there. He just sort of laughed, you know, he, has, he had a certain laugh at Peter, it was sort of a, in between a laugh and a smirk, and he went, mm, you know, and a, you know, one of them mucky women. So whether that were a prostitute or somebody he knew, you know, I couldn't honestly say. For the first three years of their marriage, Peter and Sonia Sutcliffe lived with her parents at Clayton. Then, in 1977, they moved into a four-bedroom detached house, which cost £16,500, at number six Garden Lane in the fashionable Bradford suburb of Heaton. That year, 1977, saw the Ripper at his most active, killing four women and leaving two more for dead. It became clear at the trial that Peter and Sonia's relationship was somewhat strained, but this was not altogether obvious to the rest of the family. The marriage was perfectly happy. They were working hard on the home they got. They worked hard to get it. And uh, it wasn't just a house. It was a home. They made it into a home. It was a beautiful place. And they'd done it all themselves. And there was no cause to think at all that there was any problems, if you like, between them. Police are now satisfied that Sonia Sutcliffe knew nothing about her husband's nocturnal activities because he often worked overnight and she had a job as a nursing auxiliary. The couple were devoted to children, but apparently were unable to have a family of their own. At the time of Sutcliffe's arrest, they were contemplating the idea of adopting two Vietnamese boat children. Well, it's fairly common knowledge now because the neighbours neighbors have put it round to the... Um to the different press agencies that Sonia actually had a couple of miscarriages. Did Sonia or Peter confirm that? Oh yes, Peter, Peter told, came down here and told us uh, before his mother died and he was absolutely heartbroken about it. Was Sonia distressed as well? Well, we didn't see Sonia for quite a few weeks. She didn't come out till she completely got over it and by the time she did come, come again, uh, she seemed to be quite normal again. At the height of the inquiry, the man who'd been leading the Ripper Hunt, West Yorkshire's Assistant Chief Constable George Oldfield, suffered a heart attack after 33 years' service and had to be taken off the case. He was bitterly disappointed regarding the arrest of the Ripper as a personal challenge and because, over the years, he developed a clear idea of the sort of man he was looking for. We have a picture of a man 
early 30s upwards, possibly to mid 50s. Uh, a man, an artisan, skilled, semi skilled type rather than the executive clerical type. A strong, well built man. Uh, a man who obviously has a motor vehicle. A man who has a hatred of women of the streets, which could be for a variety of reasons. Uh, Generally, I think we have a pretty good picture in our mind's eye of the type of individual that we're looking for. Peter Sutcliffe, while never a prime police suspect, was questioned by them on nine occasions. The first time was after his car was spotted in Chapeltown, the red light district of Leeds. The second occasion was after a brand new five pound note was discovered on the body of one of his victims, Jean Royal, otherwise known as Jordan, in Manchester more than three years ago. Police believed it could have been issued at the Bradford engineering firm where Sutcliffe worked as a long distance lorry driver. Every driver on the payroll was interviewed, including Malcolm Crook. We got a total 100% police search Honours, respective homes, saliva samples, blood sample, handwriting sample, teeth, uh, they checked his tools, his boots for feet print, so, car tyres, pulled his cars in bits, and everything turned out normal. And then two years later, they did exactly the same again. At the particular time, they went through us all together, all in a block bunch. Not, they did us as individuals at his own homes, but they did us all on the same, same evening, on the same day. So the following morning, it's, we're just chaos at work, everybody was talking about it and that were it. What was Peter Sutcliffe's reaction to this? It's, it was just the same as anybody else's. They did my card, did the dull your teeth, did they take a blood sample? It, it just sort of, same as everybody else's. Despite rigorous questioning, during constant visits from the police, Sutcliffe remained unshaken, and both he and his wife gave police alibis. The managing director of the firm, where Sutcliffe earned £140 a week, is Mr William Clark, who remembers the £5 note inquiry. Four or five firms in this area drew money from that uh, bank on a certain date, and it went on from there, and they came in and they checked through everybody in the works to check on, uh, on the money and also on where they were on certain days. That took about a, well, a week after then certain uh, other things came in the handwriting. And they came in again and we had to uh, check all the dates over again. They went through all the handwriting again. And uh, we had to write a certain uh, sentence out, which actually didn't make sense, but obviously there were certain words in there that had to be uh, reproduced. Uh, they then took Peter, was taken in for further questioning, uh, to the police station was there for a quite a considerable time. It's now clear that Sutcliffe realised his mistake over the five pound note and returned to Manchester where the body of Jean Royal was still undiscovered. He wanted to trace her handbag and planned to decapitate the body in order to remove the Ripper's trademark, hammer blows to the skull. All this took place after a housewarming party at the new home in Garden Lane, Bradford but Sutcliffe still managed to drive several relatives home before making a frantic dash across the Pennines to the murder spot. Assistant Chief Constable Jim Hobson, who took over from George Oldfield, explained why Sutcliffe was never high on the list of suspects. He was seen on several occasions. This was in connection with a murder inquiry in the Manchester area when a five pound note was found on one of the victims. And of course it was traced back to the Bradford and Bingley area. When he was seen on that occasion, it was only in relation to tracing money to the Yorkshire area. He wasn't seen as a suspect on those occasions, and he was one of 8,000 people at that time. But on the second occasion he was seen, this was in connection with the inquiries that we had been doing in the West Yorkshire area uh, and various other large cities outside this area. Uh, it feels fairly secure because both those uh, inquiries, uh, it was not really a suspect. We were looking for information uh, and therefore it feels fairly secure. 
For nearly three years, the police were hunting the wrong man. This was because in March 1978, they received three letters and a tape recording from a man with a Sunderland or Newcastle accent claiming to be the Ripper. I'm Jack. I see you are still having no luck catching me. I have the greatest respect for you, George. Good Lord. You are no nearer catching me now than four years ago when I started. Well, it's been nice chatting to you, George. Yours, Chuck the River. Hope you like the catchy tune at the end. Ah, ah. It's now widely believed that the letters and the tape recording were the work of a super hoaxer, although there's the possibility that the author was responsible for another murder in Preston and was trying to shift the blame onto the real ripper, Peter Sutcliffe. But from a very early stage, Mr Jack Windsor Lewis, a linguistics expert at Leeds University, was convinced that the police were on the wrong track. I heard the, the tape, as everybody else did, that was released uh, at about the 26th of June, 1979. And uh, at that moment, I expected that a voice so immediately identifiable as that would be identified, and one expected that the man would have been apprehended within a day or so of the release of the tape. Well, it's quite impossible, I'm sure, that he wasn't immediately recognized by several people, at least when the broadcast was made initially. Uh, but they immediately recognized that they'd heard somebody who could not possibly have committed any murders. So they, they immediately passed over him. They, they left him totally out of consideration. So why didn't the police accept his advice? We still felt that the evidence against its being the killer's voice was so strong from our linguistic point of view that we, we, never, uh, we were never convinced. They had to take action and they were quite right to do so when they did. Uh, the greatest appointment for them and us was uh, the fact that nothing came of it and uh, uh, naturally uh, as time went by it seemed more and more likely that they had taken the wrong direction in giving credence to this tape and letter as being the work of the murderer. But Assistant Chief Constable Jim Hobson who by now was leading the hunt for the Ripper justified police action. On all murder inquiries you know we follow all lines of inquiries and many of them are fruitless this isn't unusual on this series of murders, but of course, on this occasion, there have been a number of murders when the letters and tapes were received. And one is faced with the problem, well, what shall we do? Shall we not tell the public about those tapes and those letters? Just imagine the outcry there would have been had we not published those letters and tapes. And the man responsible was in fact the author of those tapes. Two people who suffered great embarrassment from the £1 million advertising campaign mounted after the letters and tapes were received were Fred Catto and his wife Julie. I'm not quite sure when I strike again. But it will be definitely sometime this year. At first, when it first started, it was just a joke, really, to me. But then it starts, you know, people are always uh, worried that I'm constantly cracking to you, uh, even calling us Jack sometimes. I'll give you an instance, actually. We just, uh, Julie jogged me memory last night, and there used to be this tuck shop just across the road from where we were working, you see, and it was closed this day for an holiday. So we went looking around for another shop to get something to eat, and we found this one, and I went in first, and I says, do you do any sandwiches, love? And she says, no, but I can do you some. And I could, I could visibly see the colour drain from her face, I could. Anyway, she went running into the back, made us up a few sandwiches. She only charges about 20 pence. <laughs> Some of the sandwiches, I just to get us out of the shop, I think. Fred was mending the car outside and they came in and um, it upset me a little bit because they were asking me questions about Fred. And Fred wasn't present, such as, um, does he go out on his own on a night? How's your sex life? which was one that took me back a bit. Um, what does he wear to go out in? Have you got a good relationship? Does he ever get angry at the children? Does he like women? All these type of questions, you know, well, Fred wasn't present. But uh, luckily I've got a sense of humour as well, so you can, you can banter them back, really, you know, which is 
how you've got to handle that situation. There was nobody more relieved than us, though, when that car oh. was uh, I was over the moon, mate. Public anger at the Ripper's activities reached a peak after the last murder, that of Leeds University student Jacqueline Hill in November last year. The vicar of her local church expressed the feelings of many at the funeral service. All who knew her speak with admiration of Jacqueline Hill, and we are glad that we knew her. We feel a deep sense of shock, grief, and anger because her death was not an accident, and we hope and pray there may be no more funerals like this one. By now, feelings were running so high that West Yorkshire's chief constable, Mr. Ronald Gregory, set up a special Ripper think tank of senior policemen. He also received a visit from the Home Secretary, Mr. William Whitelaw, who ran the gauntlet of angry and frightened women when he arrived. Well, I've had the chance of coming here uh, to see Chief Constable of the West Yorkshire Police today. I was very anxious to do so in order to show them the complete confidence that I have in all the work that is being done. I am very glad that the Chief Constable decided that he would like the full assistance of the British Police Service and with the discussions with my inspector at Stabbery, he has assembled, and with the help of other forces, some very considerable brains of the police service in the particular field of detection. I believe this shows the complete dedication of the whole police service to helping the West Yorkshire police in their very difficult and important task. Sutcliffe's victims ranged in age from 16 to 46. The youngest was Jane MacDonald, killed in the early hours as she walked home through Chapel Town in Leeds. Her father, retired railwayman Wilf MacDonald, never recovered from the shock. Her mother, Irene, will never forget. I've had a good friend of mine, her son, come running and saying, uh, Uncle Wilf's crying and, and they've never seen my husband cry before, you see. He said, and there's some big men in, there could be policemen, he says, and uh, he's crying, so I knew so, and I knew it could only be connected with Jane. She was the only one not in the house, you see. And uh, when the police said, are you uh, Mr. MacDonald, Jane MacDonald's father? And he said, yes. He said, and wait while she comes in. I'll kill her for not ringing. So they said, you won't have to do. Somebody's done it for you. Melissa Birdsall, you'll recall, told of how her ex-husband Trevor always harboured the belief that his friend Peter Sutcliffe could be the Yorkshire Ripper. He admitted as much at the Old Bailey trial. At first, he wrote to the police anonymously. Finally, he decided to visit them in person. They, they didn't want to know when he went down. I asked him, I said, had you told him about that stone in the sock? And he'd left in the car for an hour and... You know, I, I, you know, he used to go out regular and all that, and he said he had tools in his car as well. I said, did you tell police that? He said he told them everything and they just weren't interested. Last June, Sutcliffe was breathalyzed as he drove through Manningham, the red light area of Bradford. He was given notice of intended prosecution. When he was arrested in the company of a prostitute early this year, his car carried false number plates and the men who detained him were not from the Ripper squad, but two policemen on routine vice patrol. It was just a matter of luck. You've got to create that piece of luck yourself, you know, in all murders. Unless you do all the things that you should do, unless you conduct a thorough investigation, then you don't get that piece of luck. Uh, I think probably he uh, was beginning to think, well, he was a little bit smart, uh, and there was just a need then to put false number plates on, onto his car, with a view to evading arrest. Uh, certainly on many murder inquiries, as you know, when we do house-to-house -house inquiries, the whole idea, and the whole idea of a, a murder inquiry, is to make the man panic, to do something that he wouldn't normally do, and then we recognise that, and then he comes within the net. And of course, at the end of the day, we've won, we've caught the man, and we've solved all these murders. I do hope that the public uh, will remember that. There have been many theories about Sutcliffe's motives for killing. Only once did he have sexual intercourse with a victim. None of them was robbed. So is he a woman hater? His brother Mick thinks not. As far as I know, I can only tell you what I think and what I know. 
But I've known him a lot of years. I've been out drinking with him many and many a night. We've chatted birds up over the years. And he's been just beautiful with them, you know. He's no trouble whatsoever. It's, it's just unbelievable. There's no way he hated women. No way at all in my mind. I said one or two things when I've been to visit him in jail, but I just can't say anything about that, you know. It's, it's just between me and him is that, but... You know, it's no excuse, no reason he's given me whatsoever when he's told me. I mean, it, I don't think he knows himself. I just, I can't think of one instance, not just, just not one instance, why. Other theories include Peter Sutcliffe's upbringing. Local gossips talk about his father's womanising, but John Sutcliffe wants to put the record straight. Absolute nonsense. I only had, I only had one affair about four years before my wife died. And uh, that was a, the, the family all understand about it why it happened and um, to say that I had lots of girlfriends is absolute nonsense. Did it at any time occur to you that it could have influenced Peter though? I mean, even though now you know that it didn't, uh, were you concerned that it might have done at the time? Most certainly. Most certainly. That's why I gave a, a full account of it to the, both the police and to the solicitor so that if necessary, the psychiatrist could use this thing to see if it had any bearing on it. But later, when I found out that he'd actually been attacking girls for some years before this happened, I knew that it was no, it was no longer uh, uh, an argument. So there's no point in pursuing that any further. For much of the inquiry, Wakefield psychiatrist Dr Stephen Shaw advised the West Yorkshire police and kept in close contact with colleagues working on the case. At the trial, Sutcliffe was described as a paranoid schizophrenic. So how did doctors reach this conclusion? He fell into one of the two broad categories which psychiatry has traditionally said should be looked for when a major crime of this nature was being investigated. The two categories were the aggressive psychopath and the psychotic. It is most commonly the aggressive psychopath who commits these offences, but now it is clear that Sutcliffe was psychotic. It's equally clear that we can add other adjectives to that and say that he was delusionally psychotic and indeed that it was a suppressed delusional psychosis. Now what do we mean by these terms? We mean that he suffered from a form of mental illness where his mind lost touch with reality. That, in effect, is the psychosis part of it. The delusional element means that his mind suddenly, perhaps more than five years ago, entertained a thought which became totally fixed and permanent in his mind that he was being instructed by God to go out and murder prostitutes. Suppressed means that he simply had the capacity to keep this homicidal thought and the fact that he lost touch with reality at times a secret from everybody around him. This therefore would enable him from time to time to simply go out and murder a prostitute to return home and without making anybody aware of what he has done carry on at his place of work as though nothing had happened. I asked Dr. Shaw then if he could say whether Sutcliffe was born with a mental disorder or whether his condition developed as he grew up. You have asked the $64,000 question in psychiatry. You have summed up the whole debate of is a disorder such as this nature or nurture? Is it the way that people are brought up? Or is it in fact that these individuals simply have chemicals inside their brain where the mechanism has gone wrong? We, if I'm honest, don't know. There's a lot of research which indicates a genetic element to it, that it's an heritable, inheritable disorder. There's also a lot of research in terms of the way children are brought up. People talk about schizophrenogenic mothers. It may be a combination of everything, but so far as I am concerned, it is a chemically determined disorder of brain function. It's a queer subject when you know, actually, he is the Ripper, but when you've known him 
as a friend, biggest party alive, to my mind he's still a friend. I'd go out with him tonight. Why? It's a friend, he's a very good friend. He's been good to me all my life. He's helped me out, fixed me cars. If you ever needed an hand where you couldn't, you know, on your own, Peter would help you. If you ever needed a loan, if you'd got any money, Peter would help you. He'd, he'd do anything for you. You'd, you don't know what turns a fellow that way or what causes him to do it. But I'd trust him with my daughters, my own daughters, and the person I know. In spite of everything he's done, in spite of what he has become, he's still my son. And I'm going to have to live with this the rest of my life. Um, I'm not condoning what he's done. I'm not defending him in any way. Whatever, it, whatever punishment he's got. He'll have to bear with it. He knows that himself. But no way am I going to desert him. I'm not going to write him off. I want to remember the lad as he was. The fact that these things have happened is always, of course, going to be in the back of our minds. We shall never forget all the trauma of this thing. And the... Um, the victims and their, their relatives, we shall always, I'm sure, have the deepest sympathy with all of them, whoever they are, wherever they may be. It's a terrible thing to have to bear. It's a terrible thing to have to live with. But we've got to live with it. We've got to learn to live with it. My husband had to identify Jane, you see. And uh, I think that was the last straw. When he got back from the mortuary, he just collapsed and we had to get the doctor in and after that the doctor was coming three times a day for about a month and then every day for about two months after that to give him injections. The nervous system hadn't been able to take it and it brought bronchial asthma on and it was chronic bronchial asthma, you know. And uh, he never looked up no more after that. He never went no further than the garden. And. Uh, if somebody broke his subject, his eyes would just fill with tears. So people used to avoid that that knew him, you know. And he says, Rini, I've been all through the war. He says, but when you look at your own flesh and blood on a slab like that, he says, it's just different. And he used to be a good sketcher. And I used to pick papers up where he'd sketch Jane. As that would just, and it really was a big obsession that he'd lived to see this man caught, but he died. Wilf MacDonald died of a broken heart, one of the many innocent victims to suffer indirectly at the hands of the Yorkshire Ripper. And to echo the words of his father, Peter Sutcliffe has got to learn to live with that. He's got to learn to live with the fact that he killed 13 women and destroyed the lives of seven others, the victims who suffered terrible injuries but nevertheless recovered. He's got to learn to live with the fact that for more than five years, he terrorised, brutalised and degraded a number of northern towns and cities where he wielded the hammer and the knife. He's got to learn to live with the fact that he rendered 23 children motherless, that he cost the nation four million pounds and five million hours of police time, that a well-liked and respected police officer suffered two heart attacks at the peak of a distinguished career and that the people of West Yorkshire are even now still recovering from the way in which the Ripper caused a traumatic and dramatic change in their everyday lives. The doctors have had their say, the jury have made their decision, but in the opinion of another leading psychiatrist, it will be many years yet and medical science will be much more advanced before we even begin to understand what really went on in the dark mind of Peter Sutcliffe, the man history will remember as the Yorkshire Ripper. That was a Radio News production. Presenter, Chris Underwood. Producer, Ian Anthony. BBC, 7 o'clock. This is the news. Peter William Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, is beginning a life sentence in jail after being found guilty of murdering 13 women by a jury at the Old Bailey. The jury weren't able to reach unanimous verdicts, but by a majority of ten to two, they returned after nearly six hours of deliberation to reject Sutcliffe's pleas of manslaughter on the ground of diminished responsibility. 
The judge recommended that Sutcliffe, who's 34, should not be released on license for at least 30 years. The judge, Mr. Justice Borum, said it was an unusually long period, but Sutcliffe was an unusually dangerous man. The judge commended the assiduous performance of two police officers who arrested Sutcliffe after the biggest manhunt in British criminal history while on humdrum and routine duty. For five years, Sutcliffe, a lorry driver from Bradford, had driven freely over a wide area between Leeds and Manchester, attacking women. <laughs>